Hello, everyone. It's great to be back. Wishing you all a wonderful 2023. We've got an excellent year lined up for you here at Skeptics in the Pub online. For those of you joining us for the first time, our speakers come from a wide variety of backgrounds, the arts, sciences, humanities. But what they've got in common, and I suspect the reason you join us, is that they all approach their topics from a rational, evidence-based point of view. If you're joining us in the Twitch chat this evening, I'm sure I don't have to remind you to be civil and respectful to all the other chat users. Our mods will be posting useful and interesting links in there from time to time, such as how to ask a question of our speaker. Go to sitp.online forward slash ask or how to help with our running costs. That's sitp.online forward slash donate. Our speaker is going to talk for about 40 to 50 minutes. Then we'll have a 15 minute break and be back for the Q&A. So don't sit on any burning questions, put them into Slido. And on to the main event. Tonight, we have our resident vexillologist, Dr. Tom Williamson. I take my hat off to anyone who didn't have to look that word up. Tom's PhD was in systems biology, but he, he ignored all of that to work in software. And you may know him as the Quizmaster Supreme from our online quizzes or heard him on his Retrospecticus podcast. You may even have seen him last year at Skepticamp on tonight's subject of flags, bits of cloth and pictures that can have surprising effects on people. I have to admit, I had no idea what to expect at first about a subject I feared might be a tad mundane, but like everyone else, I was captivated by the deep flag rabbit hole which Tom takes us down to get delightfully lost in. So please, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Please put your virtual hands together to give a riotous Skeptics in the Pub Online welcome to Dr. Tom. Hello, everyone. Yep, very glad to be here. Very happy to be giving the first uh, online Skeptics in the Pub talk of 2023. And I got the year right, which is a good start. So I've called my talk The Skeptics Guide to Vexillology. And yes, that is a really hard word to say, but if I ever do a comedy show about this, I know exactly what I'm calling it. So, flags. Flags are absolutely everywhere. From, you've got the UN there, and every country has a flag, states have a flag, you know, people have a flag. But before I do anything else, I'd just like to say... I'm doing a full-length talk about flags at a sceptic group. <laughs> now, you will also notice a few Simpsons memes in my talk. That's because I'm also a massive Simpsons fan. As Cleo said, I do a podcast called Retrospecticus with my mate Gareth, where we talk about an episode of The Simpsons and a historical event that happened roughly the same time that it was broadcast. So it starts off with, you know, Berlin Wall, full communism, all of that sort of good stuff. All very interesting, I think, anyway. So with that plug out of the way, let's get on with it. So a bit about myself. I do have a PhD. It has absolutely nothing to do with flags whatsoever, but I am considered a bit of an expert on the cyclic AMP cycle in yeast, so if you've got a burning question about that for some reason, you can ask me afterwards. And you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, I know exactly what this guy's like. He's loved flag since he was a kid and he's got some sort of social weird issue with it. And he, you know, he's, he's, he's Sheldon Cooper, basically. That's, I, I know everyone thinks that. Uh, and you would be right. That is exactly what I'm like. So here's me with my grandfather who was called William Williamson, uh, or Bill to his friends. I'm not entirely sure what my great-grandparents were thinking, but uh, uh, that's one of the few pictures that exist of myself and him together. Please ignore the red baseball hat. It was the 90s. I didn't know what I was doing. But I got my love of flags from him because after he passed away over 20 years ago, my, my grandma said, oh, you like flags. Would you like his flag collection? I went, oh, yes, please. So that is his flag collection. It's now our flag collection because there's uh, some of some in there I bought. And it's an interesting collection. I just want to show you a few highlights. I found all of these flags on the same uh, in the same holder. So all together were rainbow flag, 
so pride flag uh, with six stripes so that's about the third iteration of it but as you can tell it's quite old so this way before like the progress pride flag or anything like that but on the same stand there was flag of the ussr yes um because there was a time right at the end of the ussr about 1990-1991 where western tourists could go there and my grandfather took advantage of that but also in that stand was this the confederate battle flag uh, how those three flags existed together i have no idea but more on them later but uh, vexillology as a hobby for a long long time i kind of treated it as sort of my secret shame i didn't really want to advertise what i was into flags because i thought that's a bit bit weird and so sort of, how, how do you get involved in that sort of conversation how do you tell people that you're into flags and then after i moved to liverpool got to skepticism and met up with these guys the merseyside skeptic society fantastic bunch of people and i started talking to them about flags and they basically said to me look if you want to be weird be weird look at us do you think anyone minds that we're weird anyway so that's what i did so i became a proud flag nerd there i am on stage at ignite liverpool i think i was talking about the first world war in that talk but uh, i'd just been given that ties christmas present i was happy to show it off and i've done plenty of talks on flags at qed there's me demonstrating the flag of the benin empire which illustrates uh, a nude man cutting the head off another nude man so i know that being into flags as a hobby there are some downsides to it so so people who fly flags they've got a little bit of a negative image so they're associated with the far right and you know sort of right-wing UKIP types. So after the Brexit referendum in 2016, Councillor Brian Sylvester thought it would be great to celebrate the result by flying the Union Jack the wrong way round between two bins. Here. Also with flags, there's quite a lot of sort of rigmarole and tradition. And I'm not one of those people who... Like if if the flag is flying ever so slightly wrong, I'm I'm not going to get on my high horse about that sort of thing, and yeah, like I say, I'm not like that. So if I see the Union Jack Union flag on fire, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to be that bothered. But why do I find flags interesting? Well, quite simply, flags tell stories. You look at more or less any flag, and if you ask. Why is that flag like that? How did that flag come about? You will learn something pretty interesting. As an example, just want to take you through the flag of Indonesia. Now, Indonesia, very populous country, population of 120 million, I think. And you may be thinking, well, that flag is really dull. It's basically Poland upside down. Red stripe, white stripe. How on earth could that be interesting? Well, it's interesting once you learn how it came about. So at the end of the Second World War, that's, sorry, during the Second World War, Indonesia was occupied by Japan. Before that, uh, the Dutch were in charge. It was a Dutch colony. But there was also an Indonesian independence movement, as you might expect. So once the Japanese had been defeated, once they surrendered to the Allies, a group of Dutch internees, former prisoners of war, uh, took over the Hotel Yamato and raised the Dutch flag. Now, that really annoyed some Indonesian nationalists. And I'm aware I'm telling a simplified version of this story. So if you know it, sorry, that's what I'm doing. Um, so the Indonesian, Indonesian nationalists got to the flag and they cut off the blue stripe to give the flag of Indonesia. So the flag of Indonesia is the Dutch flag with the blue cut off. Yeah, you've learned something already. But this is a skeptical show. I'm a skeptic myself. So what's the skeptical perspective on all this stuff? Well, 
I've had a think about it, and I've realised that sceptics like to debunk things. You know, commonly held misperception, misperceptions. They go in and they say, no, actually, it's this. So I've found a few things, and we'll discuss them as we go on. So um, flags featured very prominently last year in the UK because it saw uh, the death of the Queen, death of Queen Elizabeth II. There you see the royal, her royal standard over a coffin. And a lot of flags were flown at half-mast, and this was kind of a boon time for people who look at flags and like to notice things that are wrong, because there's a right way of flying the flag at half-mast and a wrong way. The way you're supposed to do it is lower it just enough so that you could fit another flag above it. Flying a flag half-mast does not mean literally fly it halfway up the flagpole. That's a mistake that a lot of people make. So why are flags flown at half-mast? Well, obviously it's done as a sign of respect when someone dies, and I think it goes back to the 16th century. Why that's done? If you read some, some literature, you'll say that it's to make room for an invisible flag of death, which goes above the national flag. I would contest that i think that's quite i think that's quite a nice little story but i don't think it's true the fact is no one really knows for sure why flags are flown at half mast my own uh, idea is that it's kind of like bowing because usually what you do if you fly a flag is first thing in the morning and uh, if you want to see this done go to mexico city go to the Zacalo because they have a huge flag and they make a big deal out of it so first thing in the morning you you put the flag up the pole, have it flying. End of the day, you take it down again. If you're flying it at half mast, you put it all the way up, then lower it, then lower it a bit, and have it flying like that for the day. And then at the end of the day, you put it back up again, and then you take it down. So it's it's kind of like bowing. It's like up and bow, up and then down again. So that's why I think people fly flags at half mast, but no one really knows for sure. So back to vexillology. Well, vexillology means the study of flags. There's also vexillography, if you want to make them. And it's one of those hybrid words like television. It's got, um, it's got a Latin bit and a Greek bit. So the Latin bit comes from vexilla. There's an example uh, up there. So that, that's, that's not a flag as we know it. That's a sort of bit of cloth that's hung off a spear and obviously the ology bit comes from greek flags do have uh, an anatomy there is a bit of terminology to get through so the most important bit is the top left is called the canton or canton if you prefer to say it like that the rest of the flag is called the field so if you have a flag which is so 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 say this flag of Switzerland is a white cross on a red field. The part of the flag that's closest to the flagpole is called the hoist. That's usually on the left, but obviously it depends which way the flag's flying. And the half which is furthest away from the hoist is called the fly. So that so those are the most important bits. Canton, hoist, fly. So we're going to cover a few subjects tonight. First thing I'm going to talk about, what makes a good flag? Because I have so many discussions <laughs> about this with people, especially fellow flag nerds in various forums. I'm going to talk uh, about some lessons that you can learn from flags and uh, a few examples. So I'm going to start with the UK, then do the USA, then do Europe, and finish on the nice juicy stuff. We're going to talk about some fascist flags. But what are flags for? And this is so important to understanding what makes a good flag. Are they for decoration? No, they're not. If you want to decorate somewhere, you know, paint somewhere nice or, or, or hang up a portrait or something like that. Illustration? No. Um, write a book, paint a picture. Showing off? Definitely not. No, a flag is for identification. The whole point of having a flag is that someone goes, oh, yeah, I know who that is. That's um, that's Britain or that's America or wherever. 
So I'm not entirely sure if this is going to work on the stream. If it doesn't, never mind. But uh, I'm going to put a little test up. So I'm going to put a flag up for 0 0.1 of a second. Like I say, if this works, great. If it doesn't, never mind. And it's going to appear for 0 0.1 of a second. And I want to see if you can identify it just from it flashing up. It's going to go boop. So hopefully you'll be able to identify it, and hopefully I'll have made my point. So flag one. Hopefully you'll solve out what that was. Flag two. Flag three. Flag four. And finally, flag five. Did you did you notice what all of those were? Well, they were France. Ukraine and Britain, very recognisable. Uh, then another one that's also very recognisable. And then a really unrecognisable one, that's a flag of Belize. And hopefully I'm going to prove my point because that flag is far, far too complicated. So what makes a good flag? And at this point, I should say this isn't just my own personal opinion. These are the uh, opinions of the UK Flag Institute, which I'm a, which I'm a m member of, and NAVA, the North American Vexillological Association. They are both members of, and let's see if I can get my French right, Fédération Internationale des Associations Vexillogiques, or FIAV. It's a bit like it's a bit like swibbing. It's a bit like FINA. It's it's known in French for some some reason. So that's the international flag body. So these are the rules of flag design. The first rule of flag design, keep it simple. The second rule of flag design, keep it simple. And a lot of people break the first two rules of flag design. For example, whales. Everyone goes, oh, whales, what a great flag. How cool is that dragon? It's like, yeah, it's a pretty picture. It's not a great flag design because it's really complicated. So anyone who has to uh, draw the Welsh flag by hand Sometimes I take shortcuts. And you end up with something like that. But one of the things to remember about flags is that a flag is not a two-dimensional image. A flag is an object. So you should be able to recognize it when it's flying or when it's at rest. So that flag that's on screen now should be fairly obvious what that is, even though there's no wind. And also, you've got to remember that most of the time when you see a flag, it won't be right up in your face. It'll often be small and far away. So you've got to be able to recognise it even when it's tiny. Another rule is that flags should be distinct. If they're not distinct from other flags, you can cause a hell of a lot of confusion. So on the left is Chad and Romania. Or is it the other way around? No, I don't know. Chad on the top, Romania on the bottom. On the right, we've already seen it. On the top, you've got the flag of the Netherlands. And then uh, on the bottom right, you've got flag of a very small country next door, that of Luxembourg. I don't know why the flag of Luxembourg is like that. It looks like the flag of the Netherlands that's been in the wash too many times. Another rule is that make sure that the front is a mirror image of the back. Don't try and be clever like Paraguay are. Paraguay fought, like so many flags, will have three stripes and our seal in the middle. And then someone said, can we have a different seal on the back? And they went, yeah. Honestly, this flag causes headaches for people who make flags, because whenever they, whenever someone orders a flag of Paraguay, they've got to print two flags and they've got to stitch them together. So, yeah, make the front a mirror image of the back, you save a a lot of people, a lot of hassle. Another thing to do is don't make the edges white. You'll have noticed that I'm using a light blue background for this talk, because if I were to use a white background, these flags, you've got Russia, Cyprus, Poland, and Qatar. If you make the background white, for example, they're flying against white clouds, they look like that. They disappear, basically. Another thing is don't add writing. No one's going to read it. If you see a flag and you're in a car or something, you you have 
fractions of a second. And if in at the best you'll go, oh, it's got writing on it. Oh, it's gone. So don't add writing. Next one is is a thing I talked about at QED, and it's one of my favorite little pet subjects. It's the law of tincture. Now, this is a graphic design law that goes all the way back to 1568. So it comes from heraldry, and it says no metal on metal and no color on color. So in heraldry, the metals are yellow and silver, or white and yellow, and colors are basically everything else. And this law says, don't put the two together. Why no metal on metal? Well, because it looks gaudy. If you if you put metal on metal, it looks like you've got a lot of wealth, but you really don't know what to do with it. But there is quite a lot of, I don't like the word, but quite a lot of nuance with the law of tincture. So, for example, what does on mean? Well, it comes from heraldry, and coats of arms are three-dimensional objects, so you can have something physically on something else. But with flags, it's not so clear-cut. So if you look at our old friend, uh, the flag of the USA, you could say that the canton is distinct from the rest of the flag. So the canton, the blue isn't really on the red. The white and the red, they're on each other, and the stars are on top of the canton, so, you, so you've got metal on colour. But you don't really have colour on colour from the canton being on the field. I think um, the Flag Institute sum, sum it up nicely uh, with, with 3.2 of their guidance, which is contrast is important, use light colours on dark, and vice versa. That is the law of tincture, basically. So, so, so it's saying go light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Don't put two t dark regions together. Don't put two light regions together, which I think is a fair compromise. But the main test for flag design is the face paint test. You know, we've recently had the World Cup. And a test of a good flag design is can you stick it on someone's face in a matter of seconds? Obviously, you can if it's something simple like three stripes, but if it's anything like the flag of Belize, if it's got anything complicated, then forget it. So that's an introduction as to what makes a good flag. Flags in action. Let's have a look at how they work. So start off with the UK. And I'm hoping that chat's going to go mad with me for the deliberate mistake. That flag is upside down. Remember that councillor from Helia who hung the uh, Union flag up from two bins? He was flying it upside down so he didn't know what he was doing. That's what it looks like the right way up. And the way you remember is the old scouts rule broadside top. You'll see that the diagonal red stripes, they're not right in, in the centre. They are over to the left, which means that the broad white diagonal stripe is, is uh, at the top. So that's, what it, so that's what it looks like at the bottom. That's what it looks like at the top. So one question that I get asked all the time is, do you call that flag the Union flag or the Union Jack? And the answer is quite simply, either is fine. That's the view of the Flag Institute. And the reason for it is because, yes, officially it's the Union flag. But the Union Jack is in such common use that everyone knows what you're talking about. If you called it the Union Colin or the Union Nigel or something like that, then yes, there would be an issue. But if you call it the Union Jack, no one's going to go, who are you talking about? I don't know a flag called the Union Jack. It's only a jack if it's off the jack stuff of a ship. Or if they do, they're being <laughs> uh, they're being rather needlessly pedantic so you can call it the union flag or the union jack so let's have a look at a bit of history of it because of course it is three flags in one uh, uh you had james the uh james the sixth of scotland uh became james first of england uh, came down and that gave birth to the original union flag from 1606 and then you had uh, Ireland being brought into the Union in 1801, and flag stayed the same since. 
So let's start with the flag of England. Uh, that is the cross of St. George, um, who, according to legend, killed a dragon. But St. George was kind of given to England. England isn't directly associated with St. George. Um, St. George is associated with England in the same way he's associated with lots and lots of other places. So on the top left there, you've got Corsica, you've got uh, Genoa, which is basically the flag of England, but with slightly different proportions. Uh, Georgia, which is St. George's Cross on steroids, really, because there's five of them. And uh, any football fan should recognise that last one, because that's Barcelona. You would you see that on their club crest. So St. George is the patron saint of all of these places, so therefore his cross appears there. Scotland, on the other hand, their patron saint is St. Andrew, and that is a uh, St. Andrew's saltier, saltire, however you want to pronounce that word. But Scotland is also, uh, sorry, but St. Andrew is also the patron saint of Russia, and this is what their naval jack looks like. And at this point, I kind of need to do, uh, uh, I need to debunk myself, because one of the first flag talks I ever did, I claimed that... After he died, St. Andrew's followers were told to take his bones to the ends of the earth. And according to some people, the ends of the earth is Scotland. According to others, the ends of the earth is Russia. I have found absolutely nothing to back that up. I've got no idea where I got that from. So in Russia, it's believed that he's he preached as far as Kiev and Novgorod. So therefore, he's venerated in not only Russia, but also uh, U- Ukraine and Romania, and there he is, because it, it, it's it's assaulted because he was he was killed on a on a on a diagonal cross, so that's why he's sort of doing that sort of hands in the air type stance. Uh, whereas in Scotland, his remains were claimed to have been divinely transported to St Andrews, uh, which might be where the ends of the earth thing came from and the legend goes the pictish king ungus the second uh he prayed to saint andrew and said that he would venerate him if he was successful in battle and he saw what he saw as a vision of saint andrew's cross uh, some clouds basically he saw some clouds in the sky so that's where the saint andrew's saucy comes from but there is a very important modern difference with the flag of Scotland these days. In the 2003, it changed colour. Mm, a very subtle change, but it went from the navy blue that you'd find in the Union flag to, uh, I think the colour's called Pantone 30. And the logic for doing this was that it's more realistic, it's more indicative of uh, you know Scotland's branding. But now... It's really distinct from the Union flag. So that's what the uh, flag of Scotland currently looks like. And that's what the Union flag looks like. It looks very different. So, of course, someone's happy. Hey. Wales, we've already seen. It's it's the dragon. So according to, the le- according to legend, it, the uh, Celtic Britons had a red dragon and the Saxons had a white dragon. They fought each other and the red dragon won. So... That's why the red dragon is the symbol of Wales. But um, just like England has St. George and um, Scotland has St. Andrew, Wales has St. David. And St. David does have a flag. That's what St. David's flag looks like. You will see it on the badges of some Welsh sports teams. And, of course, there's that old racist phrase, there ain't no black in the Union Jack. So some people have thought, well, hang on a minute. What if we incorporate St. David's flag into the Union flag, then it will have some black, and won't that be a good thing? And they've tried to do it to various eye-hurting levels, and I really don't want to have to slide up for too long, because it's terrible. So, yes, people have tried to bring the St. David's flag into uh, the Union flag, and they failed. It looks horrible. Let's move on. So, Ireland. Now, I don't want to go over the wrongs and wrongs of Ireland get, uh, getting into the UK, but... Um, that's what happened in 1801. So the flag that represents Ireland in the Union flag is the uh, St. Patrick's Saltier, which understandably isn't that popular because it's 
rotated flag of England, basically. That's all it is. And uh, now I'm going to see if I can get myself in some real hot water by talking about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland flags, it's always fun. So what is Northern Ireland's flag? It's that, right? What is a piece of debunking? No, it isn't. That is not Northern Ireland's flag and hasn't been since 1973. It's, it's called the Ulster Banner and it's the flag of the now defunct uh, Executive Committee of Northern Ireland. So that flag has had no official uh, status for about 50 years ago, uh, 50 years now. 1973 was 50 years ago, wasn't it? God, God, I'm getting old. Right. The, the Ulster Banner, you look at it and you think, yeah, that's not very Irish at all. For a start off, start was, it's the flag of England. You've then got a six-pointed star to represent the six counties of Northern Ireland. Because what you've got to remember is that Northern Ireland and Ulster are not interchangeable. Um, Northern Ireland has six counties. They're all in Ulster, but Ulster has nine counties. Three of them are in the Republic. And on top of that, you've got a British crown and the red hand of Ulster to represent Ulster. And <laughs> I could do a whole talk on the origins of the red hand of Ulster, but I'm not going to. You can look it up. So, uh, but when you look at the actual flag of Ulster, you realise, well, actually, maybe it's not that English because that's what the flag of Ulster looks like. It's got the red cross. It's got the hand. You will find the flag of Ulster in a very Irish flag. You will find it in the four provinces flag. And there you've got uh, Munster, Connaught. <laughs> and I'm laughing at the flag of Connaught because I'm a Homestar Runner fan. There will be... If I'm lucky, one or two people who will get my reference, who will know what I'm laughing at. And Ulster and uh, Leinster, of course. So over the years, people have tried to come up with various degrees of failure uh, for a different flag for Northern Ireland. So here's a few examples. Uh, in rugby, rugby union anyway, uh, Northern Ireland and Republic play together under uh, the flag of Irish rugby, which is horrible. Like, like <laughs> if you were designing a flag, that's not what you'd do. And I remember years ago, I was, I was watching baseball in the middle of, middle of the night, and they were showing some football scores, or an, an American channel, so soccer scores, and Northern Ireland came up, and they used that flag to represent uh, to, to represent Northern Ireland. And I was so shocked I got my phone out and took a picture. So that is the St. Patrick's Saltire uh, with the six-pointed star, with the red hand, but without the crown. So an American sports channel decided to use that. So that's interesting. Uh, the Alliance Party proposed a flag, which is just a blue field with a map of Northern Ireland in gold. Uh, it's not very interesting. But I have had a go at making my own flag for Northern Ireland. So this is my idea. So start off with a trickle law. We're in, we're in Europe. Lots of European countries have trickle laws. So that's what so that's what you start with. Then I thought about, OK, what what sort of traditions are there in Northern Ireland? Well, there's Catholics and uh, a colour associated with Catholicism is green. There's Protestants. And the colour that you'd associate with Protestantism is uh, orange. And the other thing you want is peace. You want peace between them. So you put a white stripe in between. Oh, no, that's already been done, hasn't it? Can't use that one. So what is the flag of Northern Ireland? Well, sorry. Officially, it's the Union flag. Sorry, that's just what it is. I don't make the rules. Don't shoot the messenger. But the Union flag is still found on loads of flags throughout the world. So top left, you've got the Falkland Islands, which is what it's called. It's called the Falkland Islands. It's not called anything else. Top right, you've got uh, uh, the Cayman Islands. Uh, oh, crap. We shouldn't have put a turtle on my flag. <laughs> we said we shouldn't have put a pineapple on it. Uh, yeah, and then bottom left, got flag of Fiji. They were going to replace it 
a few years ago, but they didn't like any of the designs, so they just stuck with the current one. They stuck with the lion holding uh, a cocoa nib, I think, in a in a bunch of bananas. And then on the bottom right, you've got the flag of Nui Island, which is a tiny little island in the Pacific, and they are taking some liberties. Taking the Union flag and sticking some stars on it. Or are they playing out? And then there's a flag of New Zealand. And that is what it currently looks like now. Understandable why they wanted to change it, because it's very, very similar to the flag of Australia. It's basically the same, but the stars of the Southern Cross are red. So they had a referendum uh, in 2016, uh, easily the worst referendum of 2016. And they put the old flag up against the new one, uh, a new design, which is the one on the, on the left, which is basically the same, only it's a fern instead of the Union flag. Uh, to be honest, I prefer the laser Kiwi one, the one on the right. I, 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 <laughs> I know it's rubbish, but there's something about it that I really like. So in, so in, their, refer- in their referendum, Remain won 56.73% to 43.27%. And believe it or not, you will still find the Union flag on flags of the USA. So this is a flag of the state of Hawaii. And, yep, it's still got a Union flag. And that brings me to the USA. We've already seen it a few times. It's one of the most recognisable symbols on the planet, the flag of the flag of states. Its origins are in the British East India Company. So... British East India Company basically ran pretty much all the trade that uh, happened, that was going on in America, and they adopted a 13-stripe flag for the 13 colonies, and uh, they put a union flag in, uh, a union flag in the Canton pre 1801. Remember, so no St Patrick's Saltier in there, uh, and then. After the Declaration of Independence, uh, the new country, the United States of America, they realized they needed flag themselves. So their first attempt uh, was this, the Grand Union flag. I don't know how they got this so wrong. The Union flag is not and has never been square. Fortunately, they didn't have that flag for very long. Uh, They had a flag act and they adopted what was known as the Betsy Ross flag. Now, you can you can debunk a lot of the mythology surrounding Betsy Ross. So, the according to legend, um, George Washington was designing a flag and he wanted six pointed stars. Betsy Ross said, "Well, actually, how about five pointed stars?" And that has gone down in you know American folklore essentially. Uh, so, Betsy Ross. She was a flag designer, flag manufacturer, very prominent, very proficient. But I don't believe there's any good evidence to link her to George Washington. So it's a really nice story, but almost certainly not true. So the next iteration uh, was of the flag it was this one. And you'll notice that this one was adopted after Kentucky and Vermont became states. So it's got 15 stars. And it's got 15 stripes. And you cannot refer to any other American flag as the Star Spangled Banner. It's a very specific term for a very specific flag. And it, of course, inspired uh, the poem that the National Anthem is based on. uh, Because during the bombing of Fort Fort McHenry, during the War of 1812, which is basically some unfinished business for British came back to the States and burnt the White House down. Um, and as part of this, they they bombed Fort McHenry, but the flag was still there, and that inspired a poem and national anthem, which is obviously based on a drinking song. Uh, if they continued to add one stripe per state, as well as one star, the flag would look something like this. That was uh, this guy is a guy called Michael Orlove of the Portland Flag Association. And one thing you'll notice is that because it's an even number of stripes, the bottom stripe is white. And that just looks so lot, so wrong because it's a white edge. A white edge does not look good. So the modern flag, as we all know, 
looks like this. And just to go down a level, beneath the national flag, there are state flags. Some state flags are good. You've got Colorado, Texas, Alaska, and New Mexico there. They tick all the boxes. They follow all the rules. Yeah, good, solid flags. But a lot of American state flags are absolutely terrible. You've got California there. And California is really so bad it's good it just disobeys all of the rules you've got a complicated picture you've got white edges you've got writing that isn't even accurate i should say state of california not california republic that was before it became a state uh, you've also got uh louisiana which we've talked about <laughs> before weirdly enough and um, which features some birds sort of pecking the blood from its mother uh, you've got Illinois, which is just terrible. It's white field, complicated picture writing. And you've got Kansas, which is more of, a, more of the same, only it's a blue field. So that's some of the really bad ones. And then there are some which are quite frankly troubling. And hopefully uh, I will convince you why. So top left, you've got Georgia, then Tennessee, then Arkansas. And that last one you might be thinking, oh, St. Patrick sought it. It's Ireland. No, that is, that's Alabama. And all of those states were all part of the former Confederacy. So the Confederate States of America existed between 1861 and 1865 during the American Civil War. And what was the American Civil War about? Was it about states' rights? Was it about any other things like that? No, it wasn't. It was about slavery. So during the American Civil War, the Confederates, the South, went to war with the North because they wanted to keep slavery. And during that time, they fought under this flag, right? Well, no, no. At no point did the Confederate Army, Army, uh, pedants, at no point did they use that flag. So the first flag that the Confederacy used was called the Stars and Bars. Uh, it was invented by a man called uh, Nicola Marshall, who was a Prussian-American and based on the flag of Austria. And not the first time that Austria was used to inspire a rather troubling flag. But anyway, so the Confederacy started up with seven states, so seven stars, and it eventually expanded to uh, 13. So you, you, it, they basically ended up with the Betty Ross flag. And that kind of gave issues because you've got to remember that this flag was taken into battle and the stars and stripes was taken into battle by the other side and if you're in a battle situation where there's guns going off and artillery and body parts flying everywhere you want to know where your side is you want to know what flag is yours so you in the american civil war the early phases of it they were going, OK, so do we go to the red and white striped flag with a blue canton with white stars in it or the red and white flag with the blue canton with white stars in it? So that was kind of a problem. But it wasn't the only flag that was being used by Confederate forces. One that ended up being very popular was the battle flag of Northern Virginia. And yes, it did have that weird two sided white outline. That's not a mistake on my part. Um, so. What the Confederates did, took them a long time to do it, but they thought, OK, everyone likes that design, so let's incorporate that into our national flag. And they came up with a flag called the Stainless Banner. So they took the battle flag of Northern Virginia and stuck it on a white field. Why a white field? To represent the superiority of a white race. Remember, not racist at all. But in battle... That also proved problematic because now they're marching into battle with a flag that's mostly white. <sighs> yes, and it took them nearly two years to correct the issue with that. And uh, it, I was tempted to include a, uh, an image of Cletus from The Simpsons because the solution they came up with was to just stick a red, uh, stick a red stripe down the side to make the blood-stained banner. But that was only in use for a few months before the war ended. But do you find the Confederate flag 
anywhere else because it's very easy to think of the american civil war uh, you know if you're in europe it's very easy to think of the american civil war as something that happened over there across the water amongst people who are nothing like us well you will find it in other places because what you've got to remember is that the confederate states made cotton and who consumed cotton well northwest of england imported through liverpool and then uh, processed in the cotton mills of Lancashire, especially around Manchester. You know, Manchester was known as Cottonopolis at the time. So what you'll find, and I went there last weekend, and I can't believe I took these pictures, um, there's an address in Liverpool called Rumford Place. Um, It's not exactly, you know, right where all the tourists are, but it's not exactly difficult to find. And you will find a load of bit, uh, pictures which honour the Confederacy. So, Rumford Place, it says there, President, Agent, Master. President is Jefferson Davis, the first and only uh, president of the Confederacy. Uh, the agent is a man called James Dunwoody Bullock, who is the uh, unofficial ambassador of the Confederacy. And the master is a man called Raphael Semmes, who was captain of the CSS Alabama, the, the name of the ship that's that's there. And you'll also see the first flag of the Confederacy, the one with seven stars, and the flag of South Carolina. Not far from that little hanging are a couple of plaques, and they try and both sides it. They, 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 they try and say that um, uh, the people who this plaque is honouring, they're we're just honouring the people who left Britain to participate in the American Civil War, because during the American Civil War, Britain had a policy of neutrality, so it was illegal to help either side, basically. And by it, there's another plaque which commemorates the CSS Shenandoah, and I love what it says. This plaque is in honour and memory of the officers and crewmen who so courageously served. Yes, yeah, so courageously served to preserve slavery. And you'll notice that the flags, you've got a British flag in the middle, um, a uh, Stars and Stripes on the right, and a stainless banner on the left. You know, that one with the white background, that's on there in, in a, in a uh, uh, on a building in Liverpool. But that's not all. There's more. So pretty much all of those buildings have their own little plaque. So there's Sims House, named after Raphael Sims, the uh, captain of the CSS Alabama. There's Enrica House, and Enrica House I find fascinating because you'll notice that the flag on there, that's not a Confederate flag. That's a British flag. That's a flag of the Merchant Navy. And it's called Enrica because what they did is that they had a ship built in Liverpool, had it kitted out as a merchant ship called the Enrica. And it sailed out of Liverpool, went to the Azores, and got kitted out as a a uh, warship, and it got kitted out as the CSS Alabama. There is a little bit of balance with the last one because because that's Winslow House that uh, that features a ship flying the stars and stripes, and it's named after John Ancrum Winslow, who was the captain of a ship called the USS Kearsage, and that sunk the Alabama. So it's it, the plaques are kind of the lifestyle, of, uh, the the life cycle of the CSS Alabama. But wait, there's more. There's also Charleston House, which has the uh, flag of South Carolina, and Alabama House, which has a flag of Alabama on it. And, you know, I'm really surprised, because you remember what happened uh, with that statue of uh, uh, Coulson in Bristol? It was uh, thrown into the water. I'm really surprised that something like that hasn't happened here. And you might think, oh, this is old. This is, this is antiquated. It's an old thing. But there's also a plaque. And if you look at the last line, it says, Plaque unveiled 6th of October 2010. So this is post-credit crunch. This is very much in living memory. 2010, someone thought, let's put up a load of monuments to uh, to the Confederacy in Liverpool. And there's no explaining about it. There's no explaining what the Confederacy stood for. There's nothing that says that slavery is bad. This is really surprising to me because modern Liverpool is this you know, really amazing place. I've I've lived, I've lived here for about 12 years now. 
and it's very European. And I, I was tempted to put up a list of everything in Liverpool that's been built with European money, but it's basically everything. Pretty much every building you can see in that photo, any anything famous in Liverpool that you can think of, at some point has received European money. So now I want to talk about Europe and uh, and, and another um, phrase which annoys me more than it should because I know what they're getting at, but it's we want our star back. Have you ever, ever seen a pro-union, uh, a pro-EU march? That's what they're saying. They say, we want our star back. So the problem is it's not one star per member state. From the inception of it, it's been 12. It's been 12 to represent unity and uh, 12 is a really nice number, basically. And European flags didn't always have 12 stars. So at the end of the Second World War, a bunch of people said, hey, instead of fighting each other, why don't we sort of pool our resources? And that's where the European coal and steel community came about. This is the first flag they used in 1958. And I'm sometimes asked, what is your favourite flag? And it might be this one. This is what you might call a big, chonky boy. This one doesn't muck around. This is, <laughs> this is saying, we do coal, we do steel, and there's six of us. So that's the flag of the European coal and steel community. As time went on, it kind of mellowed out. They, they started off adding one star per state, but they made the stars smaller, they made them white, they made the blue a lighter blue. And by 1986, it had 12 stars. It got more members after 1986, but they stopped at 12. And there have been various European flags proposed. Here's just a selection of them. They're all terrible. And there's one there, which is just a St. George's Cross uh, there's one which it's just for letter e it's, it's just an e it's rubbish um and then 1985 saw a uh, publication of the adenino report which uh, made various suggestions on how to rebrand europe and for some reason they went i'll tell you what we'll take that really nice flag you've got already and we'll stick an e in the middle why Everyone knows that that's the European flag. You don't need to hammer it home by putting in an E. And that had its own problem because it looked like Queen Elizabeth's personal standard. Okay, shield your eyes for this next one because this might be the most eye hurting flag I'm going to show. It's the 2002 barcode flag. A guy called Rem Coolhouse proposed, right, well, you take all of the colours of all the flags of all the member states and just stick them in one big flag. Ugh, horrible. But the thing to remember that the flag of Europe, the 12 stars, are there to represent, uh, you know, unity and symmetry. Um, they're not, it's not one star per state. So, so the EU, EU flag does not look like that, and it does not look like that. And having talked about uh, European flags, there's one final flag I want to talk about. It's the elephant in the room. I've got to do it. Going to talk about the flag of Nazi Germany. So if you're offended by that, please look away now. Here it is. We're all very familiar with it, I'm sure. Uh, and the thing is, there's more far right flags. And the thing is, design wise, these are great. What they stand for is absolutely vile, it's absolutely horrible. But design wise, they're brilliant. You've got British Union of Fascists on the top left. It, it follows the rule of tincture, it's simple, it's uh, easily reproduced. You've got Dutch fascists. There are Dutch fascists. That's their flag. Same deal, only it's orange because it's Dutch. Sweet. You've got Swedish fascists as well. That's their flag. Again, really great for what they want to do. And then on the bottom right, there it is again, the Confederate flag. One thing I haven't said, that's a brilliant design. It, uh, you know, covers what they want to cover. It's the same but different. So the uh, take-home message here is that a good flag is not the same thing as a nice flag. You can have some absolutely horrible, horrible people, but they can have great flags. In summary, we've seen 
the bit about flag design and the stories that you can learn from flags. But the take home lesson is this. Be skeptical, ask questions of flags because you might learn something. And thank you very much for listening. Wow, oh, thank you so much. Uh, that, was, that was brilliant, Tom. I learned so much and I, as you were talking, I was thinking, how much time have you put into finding all this stuff out? I mean, <laughs> it, it's amazing. Um, uh, be, we're about to take a break now, uh, but before we take that break, I'd just like to remind you that in two weeks' time, we have Ulrika Shisa, who's going to be talking to us about how to talk to conspiracists. Uh, so that'll be really good. Uh, we'll be back now in 15 minutes and go and refresh your glasses, find the loo. And uh, thank you very much again, Tom, and we'll see the rest of you soon. Hi, everybody again. Welcome back. Uh, I hope you've all got full glasses and empty bladders and ready to head into what's going to be a really fun Q&A. Um, I'm going to start just very quickly with Linda's question first, because she just says, the obligatory pet question. Um, we all know exactly where we are now, but I'm just going to uh, apologise to everyone that Tom doesn't have any pets to hand. So uh, we'll move on to the very first question, which is from Andrew, uh, who asks, what is the smallest unit of organisation that can credibly have a flag? And well, do you have a favourite? Well, there isn't really. Uh, li literally anyone can have a flag. Um, there's, there's this sort of bizarre paradox uh, with try, trying to get a flag for where you live. So if you live in a big city, because lots of big cities don't have flags, um, but it's really hard if, if you live in one of those big cities to, to go to your city council, whatever, and say, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we have a flag? Because it takes forever to get to the right person, forever to get to anyone who cares. Whereas if you live in a little village, so a couple of hundred people, their parish council or whatever will be grateful to have something to talk about. If so, so if you go, so if you live in a tiny little village and you go, hey, I've designed a flag, what do you think? But we, go, hey, we were just going to talk about there being too much dog mess in the park. So, oh yeah, let's talk about this instead. Um, so, so yeah. There are uh, tiny little villages in England which have their own flags, um, but but there's absolutely there's there's no limit to it whatsoever. You you, you could you could make your own personal flag, st stick it on a flagpole in your garden, and say, "There you go, there's my flag." If you wanted to, I I, I do I have met some people who've who've done that. Um, I, I remember meeting a guy at a flag conference, and he uh, bought his own personal flag, which was basically just the methodist cross so yeah you, you you could have your own personal flag if you want and people have done that so I'm whatever you want really yeah i'm wondering if we should be commissioning you to design a flag for skeptics in the pub online mm -hmm. um, i have that, thoughts about it <laughs> well let's let, let's not forget that one then um gray the earthling asked a follow-up question to that he said uh, places have flags Personal identities have flags. What's the strangest category of thing that you've seen a flag for? Um, I suppose maybe sexualities, because as well as, you know, your you, you very well-known pride flag, progress pride flag, like every denomination of sexuality you could think of has a flag. There's a BDSM flag. There's a flag who are into for people who are into rubber play. Uh, there's a, what's it called? A adult vapor type of thing. You, you know, they've got a flag. Um, uh, and and I've, I've I've seen some 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 quite almost stupid corporate flags as well. Because there's um, there's a shipyard uh, in uh, over in the Wirral called uh, called uh, Camel Laird, and named after its two founders and their flag has a camel on it even though the name of the man is not c-a-m-e-l it's it's some other spelling so yeah every time i see that i go it's not a camel but yeah loads of tiny little organizations have flags i have a terrible feeling that people are going to be sending you dodgy flags from now on <laughs> um 
uh, a question from Anonymous next. Uh, how does black come into play with the rules of tincture? Mm, that's a very good question because in sort of Eastern Europe, Eastern Central Europe, black is not really considered a colour. So if you look at the flag of, uh, flag of Albania, that's got a black eagle on a red field, and that's not considered to break the law of tincture in Albania. And if you look at the flag of Germany, that's got red on black. Same thing. Um, so, yeah, black is a bit of a wild card, and whether it's considered a colour or not sort of depends on where you are in the world. And um, Andrew uh, from Peterborough asks, what is the newest uh, that's the most recently created or designed flag that you know of? Ooh, um, thing is, there are flags being created all the time. Um, cities, villages, states, whatever you can think of, there will be somewhat, somewhere, in, somewhere in the world, someone will be having a flag design contest as we speak, like, like right now. Um, on a state level, the newest one I can think of is um, one of the American uh, southern states. It used to have, oh, I can't remember, it's, uh, so, someone, will, someone will remind me, um, but it used to have the con, the square Confederate flag in, in the canton, and it's now got, um, it's now got a nice flower in the middle. Um, so that one is pretty new. Uh, so, yeah, but like I say, there are new flags popping up all the time. Uh, and I cannot find. But, but, but anyway, it's it's a it's a state in the south. I can't remember. And, which yeah, one. well, it's rather nice that they're actually doing new flags, then, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. But, but it, it, it's got in God we trust on it, which you can't have everything. Yeah, you can't have everything, but it's a hell of a lot better than being directly related to slavery. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Linda, and this is one I really wanted to ask you, which is what is the laser kiwi actually supposed to be doing? <laughs> the laser kiwi was a joke, um, one of many, many jokes that, that, that were entered into that. So when New Zealand um, had that contest for a flag to potentially replace the one with the Union flag in McCanton, uh, they just made it open to everyone. And someone went, I'll tell you what, uh, Kiwis represent New Zealand and lasers are cool. So I'm going to have a design which features a kiwi shooting a laser out of its eye. Oh, oh and I'll put in a fern as, as well because it's New Zealand. Uh, yeah, that's the origins of it. I know it's such a shame they didn't go with that, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, question from Igor uh, to a flag designer. You're going to become a flag designer. If you were able to make one rule that any flag should abide by, what would it be? It would probably be don't have text. Because it's just you, you see any flag with text on it and you just get rid of text, it looks a million times better. You know, Brazil has, uh, I think, order and progress written in Portuguese on it across the middle. Get rid of that, looks better. Um, that American state flag I was just talking about has in God we trust. Get rid of that, looks better. Any flag with writing on it, you get rid of the writing, you make the flag better. So that would be my one golden rule. Don't have writing. Right. OK, that's noted. Um, Cass asks uh, a really interesting question, I think. But what are your thoughts on this, uh, on how Americans fly their flag, i.e. anywhere and everywhere, and how it differs from the way the flag is flown in other countries? Yeah, America is a very odd one when it comes to flags because because they have this thing called the flag code, uh, which details um, how you're meant to handle flags, how you're meant to fly them, how you're meant to dispose of them, all this sort of stuff. So it's all very tightly regimented, all very tightly regulated. Um, but they will do stuff like make clothes out of their flags, and which is something the flag code says you're not meant to do. So, yeah, it, there are lots of contradictions in how Americans fly their flags. And obviously they're very patriotic about it. It does help that the, that the flag of the USA is a really, really good design. That, that does help a lot. Um, but yeah, but, but, uh, and, yeah, and obviously there's the issue of flag burning and freedom of expression and all that sort of stuff. We could talk about that all night. But uh, um, yeah, it, 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 it's it's very interesting how the Americans treat their flag 
very interesting because to lots of other countries, including myself, a flag is you know a piece of cloth. But to a lot of Americans, it means something a lot more than that, a lot more. So in America, the flag is sort of fetishized. Does that happen anywhere else, or is it very much an American thing? Um, there are other countries that fly their flags um, a lot. I, I remember I visited Mexico years and years ago, and at the airport there were more Mexican flags than I'd ever seen in the American flags. Um, it, it, it really depends on what the flag means to people. So, you, you know, in America, it's a symbol of independence. Um, and, you know, the, the, and they have the national anthem is based on one of their flags. And you know, because they don't they don't have a monarchy or any institutions like that to revere, then they look for other things. And one of the things they do is the flag. So that's quite interesting. I don't mean to derail the questions, but um, independence sounds like quite a big thing. So if the flag represents independence, I can quite see how it might mean more than ours, which we go, oh, my God. Um, yeah, we didn't mean to do all that. Terribly sorry. <laughs> we don't like what our flag stands for very much. Is that, do you know whether independent flags of independence are more uh, revered maybe than others? Yeah, I think so, because 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 if you if you if you have people that fight under something and if you have like pictures like like, like that one of the uh, I showed of the American Civil War of people on a battlefield hoisting a flag and you know liberty and the yeah yeah fl- yeah they're fighting under it and it representing their cause then yeah it, it it does tend to mean a lot more yeah right so um Igor um asks is sort of related well, uh, now we all agree that flags are cool, but do you find other countries' paraphernalia, like uh, anthems and coats of arms, just as interesting? Not, not, not really. If I'm honest, I mean, I mean, flags are my thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure coats of arms and national anthems are are interesting in their own way, but they don't sort of penetrate into societies as much as flags do i mean so songs are cool and coat of arms are cool but, but, but you'll find them in a limited number of places flags you'll find everywhere so um completely changed uh, with anonymous asking the next question who says in your opinion what's the worst nice flag like a terrible design for a good cause mm, yeah good question i mean I would go with the flag of Tibet. So if anyone's been following what's going on there, you'll know that people of Tibet are repressed and, uh, you know, have a very tough time of everything. So you'll see the Tibetan flag in quite a lot of places, but it's far too complicated to be a good flag. Far too complicated. It's got a rough form that everyone can recognise because it, it's, a, it's a, a yellow border with a, with a mountain in the middle but everything else it's just got so many you know it's pictures it, it, it's a landscape basically so yeah it, it, it great cause not a great flag thanks back to igor who says do you think that flags will or should evolve with technology at some point sorry should we have national gifts national holograms <laughs> national <laughs> multi-sense experience well, uh, that's a that's a that's a good fun fun question. Um, I mean, often they do. I mean, fl- flags evolve with technology, so we've all got phones with with access to emojis, and there are you can get emojis of every national flag. So they, so that, that they, I think they'll always be there, and they evolve with <laughs> they evolve with technology. So yeah. They're, they're kind of an ever-present thing as well. Watch this space for a national multi-sense experience flag. <laughs> um, Chromium52 says, uh, what do you think will happen to the Union flag if Scotland becomes independent? Um, I would imagine nothing, uh, because there will be absolutely no official need to do it whatsoever. Countries can have whatever flag they like. Um, I remember a friend of mine sent, sent me um, 
a mocked up design and what they've done is that they, they've taken the blue out and replaced it with that checkered background that you get in paint programs when when it's transparent um so but, but, but i i really like that as a, as a suggestion but um if scotland does become independent they probably won't bother to do anything with the union flag i'd be very surprised if they did we could have your black it could be black maybe <laughs> you think not <laughs> Well, that would make the colour scheme black, white and red, which is mm. the colour scheme of the uh, oh, German yeah. Second Reich. Mm. So probably yeah, okay. not. <laughs> um, 66 Steve in Ireland asks, any thoughts or insights on why Australia and New Zealand were almost identical? Well, off the top of my head, I think there was a time when Australia and New Zealand were almost going to be one country. I've, I've, I've probably got that a bit wrong, but they, they were sort of contemplating the idea of being one fed, federation for a while, but then they decided against it. So the stars on both flags are the Southern Cross. The idea is that that's a constellation that you can only see in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and New Zealand are in the Southern Hemisphere, so therefore that's the design that represents them. You'll also find it on the flag of Papua New Guinea. So And you know, the former uh, British administrations, both in the British Commonwealth. So, yeah, but, but there's a lot about them which is similar and w w which is which is why they've got such such similar designs, basically. Uh, well, back to our favourite question asker, Eagle, who asks, what's the weirdest flag and why is it the flag of Nepal? Oh, I mean, anyone knows who knows me knows that I hate the flag of Nepal. It's it it it's like it, it's it's a classic pub quiz question. It's what is the only flag that isn't a quadrilateral? It's the flag of it's the flag of Nepal. But it because because can you imagine if you're a flag manufacturer and all day you're making flag you're, you're you're making rectangles basically, and then you have to make the flag of Nepal and you have to completely stop what you're doing and you have to think well how, how, how do i make it do i make it uh, a rectangle first and then cut it out because that's wasting a load of cloth do i completely reconfigure all my machines so that they can make two triangles and then stitch them together and it's even it's even really hard to measure because ratio wise most flags are like three to five or two to three the flag of nepal i can't remember the number off the top of my head but, but, but it's like five billion to four billion one hundred million and something and it's like oh it's it it looks cute it looks totally inoffensive but it's a logistical nightmare for anyone who has to work with it it's a horrible flag flag for nepal is it the only one that's non-rectangular it's the only national flag that's right. non-rectangular there are um there are subnational flags which are non-rectangular. The flag of Ohio springs to mind because it's uh, it's a sort of I think it's called a dovetail type thing. And uh, yeah, the, yeah, flags don't have to be rectangles. You 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 can have non-quadrilateral flags if you so wish, but you will be annoying a hell of a lot of people if you do. Right. Um, Bremner asks, uh, doesn't the no white edges rule only matter in pictures of flags rather than actual flags? Well, not really, because because um, a lot of the time, if, you, if you're flying a flag, um, it will not be against a clear blue sky. You'll, you, you'll have clouds and clouds are white. And if the edges are completely white against the cloud, that'll be quite hard to make out. And if you ever see a display of flags, and some of them have white backgrounds, they just really stand out as being bad because they're often hard to to work out what's on them. Because often, if you see a white flag, it'd be a white flag with a coat of arms on it. And a coat of arms is really hard to make out at a distance. If you think about like a French flag, three stripes, really easy to see at a distance. The old flag, the old flag of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, was a blue shield on a white field and trying to work and trying to work out what you're looking at if you're looking at that flag from a distance you're sort of peering at it and, well i know it's white it's got something on, on it but i can't work out what so yeah the white edges applies to all scenarios especially in the wild yeah 
Um, Nadia uh, asks, given that some of the best designs represent something nasty, do you think certain groups of people tend to appreciate symbolism more than others? And if so, why? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, but fascist symbolism is very clear. <laughs> uh, um, and one, and what, one thing I forgot to mention in the talk is that Hitler himself studied arts. So all of that stuff I was talking about, about, you know, about colors and symbols and all that sort of stuff, Hitler would have known. And if, if, if you look at the Nazi flag, there are lots of things about it that enhance it. So, so the disc is not bang in the middle. It's slightly to the left, which just draws your eye to it a bit, just because it's ever so slightly irregular it just makes you look at it a bit more. Your subconscious, you think, it's not quite right. And also the position of the swastika. He found out that if you have it at a 45 degree angle, that looks better because it looks kind of, it looks cooler. It almost looks like it's in motion. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I almost sound like I'm turning into Kanye West. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you appreciate a good flag without agreeing with the symbolism. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry, were you going to say something else about that? Um, I was only going to go deeper into fascism, so it's probably better if we talk about something else. Okay, we'll lighten the mood considerably then with Bremner's next question, who says, "This is niche. What's the best flag in the Simpsons universe, and is it the Australian boot one? <laughs> yeah, that is a great question. Um, there, there are a few flags in the Simpsons. Um, the Australian boot one, I love. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Trying to think if it's worth explaining. Probably not. Yes, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, okay. I, okay. There, there's there's an episode of Simpsons where Bart inadvertently. Um, commits telephone fraud in Australia and he's summoned to Australia and told that if he makes an apology he can go so he apologizes in front of the Australian Parliament and he's free to go right after his additional punish punishment and a man walks in wearing an enormous boot so it like clump he clumps in and uh, he's getting ready to give Bart a kick up the backside and um, uh, one of them says, uh, disparaging the boot is a bootable offence. It's one of their proudest traditions. And he points out the flag of Australia. And it's the flag of Australia, but with an arse on it and a boot uh, aiming at it. I'm not entirely sure where they got the idea of Australians kicking each other with giant boots, but, but that's where it comes from, yes. I do vaguely remember the episode, but not the flag, sorry. Um <laughs> Well, we're back to uh, 66 Steve in Ireland, who says, please give your thoughts on South Africa's new flag post-apartheid. I personally thought they were over, overly generous to the old flag, but I'm no vexillologist. OK, OK. That, that, that's a really good question, because the uh, flag of post-apartheid South Africa, they wanted uh, a flag to represent that they were going into a new era of you know, civil rights and democracy, votes for all, all that sort of stuff. So their previous flag was called the uh, Prince's flag, uh, uh, France flag in Afrikaans or something like that, which was blue, white, orange. And within it, it had three flags. Uh, it had a Union Jack, flag of Natal and flag of Transvaal, I think, to, 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 to uh, region states of South Africa, whatever they have over there. And it wasn't explicitly a flag of apartheid because because they'd used it since 1922, I think, um, which was, you know, before apartheid came in. It just happened to be in use whilst apartheid was in place. So it became known as, you know, the apartheid flag. So they designed a flag which goes against one of the uh, – sort of it's not really law but 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 one of the ideas of good flag design which is you don't have too many colors and that's got six it's got um black red and green uh oh, let me get this right now black green 
and yellow. Those are the colours of the ANC, the Afri African National Congress. And there's red, white and blue, which are the colours of the UK, colours of France, colours of the Netherlands. And they're put together in such a design that even though it's got six colours, it still obeys the law of tincture. So it's still going dark light, dark light, dark light, dark light. And I really like it as a flag. I I, I, I think it, apart from the having lots of colours, it, it ticks all the boxes. But that's very, very political because, of course, when it first came out, a lot of white people didn't fly it because they you know didn't want to accept that you know, they didn't want to accept the new post-apartheid reality, so they kept flying the old one. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a, it's a very interesting story of, you know, the, the politics of it, the, the fact that it illustrated positive regime change. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot what the original question was. I was just but it wasn't wasn't too uh, respectful of the old South African flag. But you've you've really explained why why not why it didn't need to. It was okay for it to be. I think it's okay yeah. for it to respect the old flag. Yeah, yeah, because because Nelson Mandela himself put forward the idea of the rainbow nation, the idea that everyone in South Africa could make could make a contr contribution. So the flag of South Africa should contain. Um, as many colours to represent the people of South Africa as possible, which is why it's got those six colours in it. I like that. Um, back to Bremner. Um, not a Simpsons question. He says, uh, why is the Irish cross in the Union flag broken? The diagonal lines don't match up. Mm, that's a good question. I don't know the exact answer to that. I know where it's, where it's helpful uh, because it... Um, What's the word? It's it, it's it sort of breaks up the symmetry. It gives you, uh, it it gives a right and a, and a wrong way to fly it. So, so you know, if it was bang in the middle, you wouldn't be able to fly it upside down. So I I I I think that's why it's there because you know flying a flag upside down is is a sign of distress. So if you want to be able to use a flag like that, you've got to be able to fly it upside down. But 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 I'm I'm guessing there. I don't know for sure why the diagonal stripes on the Union Jack are like that. It also does that nice thing that you were saying the Nazi flag did with the off century thing. Because yes. it gives you a sense of movement, doesn't it? When you said uh broadside up, I was thinking of it as being clockwise. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. It, yeah, it just draws your attention away a little bit because it's a little bit irregular. Yeah. So um, Paul, aka Picticule, says, uh, "Are flag are flags always represented graphically with the flagpole on the left? If not, how can you tell which way around they are?" Yeah. Okay. So so um, a, a flag in the wild uh, will will have uh, what's called a hoist. It will have um a bit of cloth that runs down the hoist that, that that strengthens it essentially and that's where you'll have your holes to put the rope through so you can hang it if you look at that picture um that that tory councillor put up of the flag between the bins you can see that hoist you can see that little white strip and that tells you that he's flying it the wrong way around um if you're looking at information uh, on the on the internet there's that the, there are whole standards of when you're presenting a picture of a flag you'll have little icons beneath it and that will give you information about which way round it is what ratio it is um how it's currently in use whether it's a national flag or a civil ensign or a military ensign or whether or if it's an obsolete flag um that there's there's a whole scheme that will tell you information information about the flag you're looking at okay that, yeah thanks um chromium 52 again uh, who asks uh, what's your opinion on the flag of finland lots of white yet easily recognizable or isn't it yes now the thing about uh, white edges is that it's only a problem if the whole of the edge of, is white you want something that tells you where the edge of the flag is. And on the flag of Finland, yes, the field is white, but the cross, the Nordic cross on it, goes all the way 
to the edges so you can tell where the edge of the flag is because of where the cross is. If the cross stopped early, if it was just a cross in the middle and the edge was completely white, then that would be a problem. But um, but because it goes all the way to the edge, you can tell where the edge is. That's good. And your brain sort of then computes where the corners are, yeah. even though it's white. Yeah. Um, oh, we've got one one for your imagination here. A uh, question from Nadia. Um, which genre should the band named the Invisible Invisible Flag of Death play? Mm, I think something gloomy. Um, if anyone's familiar with the band uh, Godspeed You Black Emperor, I think it, I think it should play that. Uh, okay, everyone, your homework specifically is to look up a few of the flags that have been named. And what was the name of that band again? Sorry, uh, Godspeed You Exclamation Mark Black Emperor. Godspeed You Black Emperor. Off you go, guys. If, 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 if you've ever seen the film Twenty Eight Days Later, the bit where London's empty. And uh, the guys walk, walk, walk around going, oh, where is everyone? <laughs> that music, the music that's playing, is a Godspeed You Black Emperor track. Okay. So if you think um, you haven't heard them, you almost certainly have. All right. And we've got a couple more questions. Um, Paul, a.k.a. Picticule, again, asks, are flags copyrighted or can anyone use them? It really depends on the flag. Uh, some flags are, some flags aren't. So, yeah, if... If you want to incorporate a flag into a design, like you're making an advert or a TV show or something, you really need to check. You are fine with most flags. For example, you're fine with the Union flag. I'm pretty sure you're fine with the American flag. But but just just a quick quick Google, just just, just like is this flag copyrighted? Just I'm not a lawyer, but yeah, but yeah to, to to avoid copyright issues, just check. Would that include any national flags? Um, it really depends who owns the copyright of it, because uh, it really it varies from country oh. to country. Most most of them, the government owns a copyright, and whether they're fine for you to use it will really vary. Right. And we're on to the last question, um, which I think might be quite quick. <laughs> uh, an anonymous person asks you, if the price of world peace was the end of all flag use, uh, would you vote for world peace? Yes. <laughs> world, world peace is more important than flags. Flags are great and they're very interesting, but world peace is more important. Definitely. So vexillology doesn't have top place in your heart? Uh, not above world peace, no. <laughs> right. OK, well, that's really great. That's 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 it for the questions. Thank you so much. I absolutely loved that Q&A. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for being there. And I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, we will see you again in a couple of weeks time for um, Ulrika Shisa. And uh, a big round of applause the way only sceptics can to Dr. Tom Williamson. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. It's been great. Thanks for having me.